My name is Adam Golov, Marketing and Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. So please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we will make them available on our website. Next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and basically get it ready for tomorrow's technology. Next slide, please. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, and transform legacy and future documents for real needs today and in the future. Next slide, please. DCL serves a broad client base. Next slide, please. Spanning all industries. Today, we are thrilled to introduce Ari Gross, CTO and CEO of C Vision Technologies. Ari is founder and CEO and CTO. Dr. Gross, PhD, received a BS degree in mathematics from John Hopkins University and a PhD in computer science from Columbia University. Dr. Gross has been very active in the research and development of new methods and technologies in the areas of computer vision, imaging, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and real-time computing for the past 20 years. His achievements include over 40 published papers and several patents in areas related to imaging, machine learning, and document automation. Without further ado, welcome Ari. Adam, thank you very much. and. Uh... We're going to present our agenda in a minute. I just want to thank everybody who's here uh, for joining us, and also uh, thanks to DCL for giving us the opportunity uh, to present to you today. We appreciate it. So the agenda we're going to go through today is a little overview about uh, C Vision. What do we do here at C Vision? Uh, based in Forest Hills, New York, some of the challenges associated with document capture, technology that lets you overcome uh, some of these uh, issues with document capture and lets you further get closer to. Uh, the paperless office, some best practices if you're going to start moving towards a paperless office, what are, what, what are things that we consider document capture best practices? We'll go through that. We'll take you through some uh, client case studies, conclusions, and of course some time for uh, questions and answers from you. Uh, a little over about C Vision, where uh, we have a pretty diverse client base. We have over 100 Fortune 500 companies as clients. We have won several global technology awards, including the Inc. 500, 5,000, I think, uh, five years in a row. Um, we have unique solutions to provide highest quality PDF files and all document automation um, in order to automate what would normally be your document-centric business processes. Uh, we're based in the United States, and all our engineering really takes place right here in the USA. Uh, so. Let's say you have uh, your company, government agency, and you've got a lot of paper, and you may also have things that are coming electronically, and you want to make the paper workflows become as seamless or as easy to use as the electronic workflows. And whether we're talking about you know, understanding what's in journal articles or what's in, on a form or making sure that all your paper is searchable and can be forwarded, so once it comes into the mailroom, you can forward the segment across the company or have it seen by multiple parties within the organization. That all would, re would require some kind of document capture. But capturing documents, of course, doesn't mean the whole problem is solved for you. Just because you scan, if you scan your paper, whether you catch it at the mailroom or whether you catch it later at the MFP level, uh, it doesn't mean your problems are solved. In fact, that's for most of our clients where the problems first begin. So if you're interested in, in smart document capture, you have to deal with the fact that when you capture documents, black and white or color, it can be very large, hard to send a mobile device. It's hard to forward uh, a mortgage document <clears throat> or a catalog or manual for running a, uh, an Air Force uh, jet. It's hard to send all that as an email attachment when it's 100 megabytes. So we have to deal with increased storage costs, unsecured documents. Now it's electronic. Someone theoretically, at least the paper you knew was in your office and somewhat secure. If you're going to forward this document across the Internet, you have to worry about where it's going to go. So document security is definitely a factor. Inefficient documents, a lot of documents that we see captured may be TIFF, which means 
non-searchable, not web optimized. Dirty images, sometimes the scanning process itself, particularly when you when it's a document that maybe was not black and white natively and you're scanning to bitonal. So it creates dirty images. You've got half tone patterns, their diffusion, um, noise. So a lot of times the images are dirty, and without some realistic image processing, you're not going to get what you want. Um, slow network bandwidth, of course. So you've captured everything, but now you want to see it in a remote office, and it takes five minutes to download or 25 minutes to download. So you're going to deal with network bandwidth, bandwidth inefficiencies and unsearchable data. So if you want to make your office paperless, document capture is definitely a way to go. We strongly recommend it. But smart document capture means that you have to get around all these issues. Because otherwise, you've captured your paper, but you still don't have this efficient paperless office. So having said that, we're not here to only tell you the problems. We're also to tell you that there is there are solutions out there. Um, so for example, to go through it, um, C-Vision, we've been an advocate of uh, advanced compression technology. A lot of this is fairly new. We were sort of involved in it from its inception. So a lot of advanced compression came about. <laughs> A lot of advanced uh, compression came about in the years, let's say, between uh, 2000, 2004, 2005, when JBIG2 was supported under Adobe and MRC. So there are some very advanced compression technologies today, and we fully support them. And they're pretty much ISO standards under PDF that lets you get your documents much, much smaller. So for example, where a black and white file might have been 100 k bytes a page under TIFF or G4, our classic PDF, these days you can pay maybe about 10, 15K per page. So really, 5 to 1, even a 10 to 1 reduction for black and white. And for color, it can be as dramatic as 100 to 1. So advanced compression is certainly one of the one of the critical aspects for what we call smart document capture. You want to be sure the electronic files are usable. You can email them. You can download them. So advanced compression is certainly one of the solutions out there when you're capturing your documents. Another thing is you probably want to make the documents searchable. Because if you capture them but you can't find anything, then there's, again, limited advantage. So you converted the paper to TIFF or JPEG or even PDF, but there's no searchability there. Can you really find what you're looking for? Um, very often you can't. Um, so OCR, which stands for Optical Character Recognition, is a very important part of going paperless. It's being able to find everything that came in as paper. And not just find it because you've indexed five fields or ten fields, but find it in a Google sense where you just type in a string that you know isn't part of the document, and the document comes up. Uh, another thing, of course, is if you have uh, documents that have some kind of security value, maybe they're health records in a hospital. Maybe they are financial transactions at a hedge fund. Maybe they are an accounting firm, somebody's W-2 or uh, 1099, things that really can't be distributed all over the network. <clears throat> And maybe you want someone to do data coding for you, but you have to send it in a way where you're very much in control over who sees it and is it viewable. So PDF, if you get the PDF, it definitely supports encryption at the viewer, edit, and print levels. You can decide who gets to view it, who gets to print it. Um, so very helpful um, to be able to encrypt or know that you've got security protocols around your captured documents. And certainly there are other ways to do it outside of PDF. But within the PDF standard, you have support for security encryption. Image enhancement is also, I would say, key to document capture. One of the things we see that really takes away from the usability of captured documents is that things aren't in sync. So it's a, cap, it's a grayscale, the color document captured a bitonal, a lot of information is lost. Or maybe the resolution is not quality enough, not good enough to get what you want. Or because the resolution is not high enough, the, uh, the data and the form the data fields and the forms all get stuck together so that the automated data processing off those forms is somewhat limited because of the interaction of uh, the foreground data against the background form, which is not good. So image enhancement is also a key component in getting really, really um, good value back, good ROI back if you decide you want to capture some of your paper-based document workflow. Um, so we have these best practices that uh, that we've been working through here at the C Vision for a long time. It seems to resonate with, with our clients. And we're just going to go through some of what we consider best practices. It doesn't mean you have to follow these. It just means in our experience with thousands of clients, we find that people who follow these practices get the best ROI, get the best results when they want to capture their document workflow. 
Uh, so, for example, PDF conversion is important. Uh, we strongly recommend PDF for a bunch of reasons, and we're going to actually show you this visually. Um, why PDF and why, why not TIFF? Why not JPEG? Why not some other format? So, among other things, you often want to keep faithful to the facsimile of the document. So you want it to look and feel like the original. doesn't mean you don't want some automated XML from DCL Labs. You, you may want to also get out the structure beneath it. That might be important. But often you want to keep at the base level the look and feel of the document to be the same. So you have it with PDF because the image is kept as an image. And what goes in underneath is a fully searchable text layer. But we call it a hidden text layer because you don't actually see it. What you see is you see the captured document itself. So you're always going to have something that's faithful to the original and legally as useful to present whenever you need to present it as the original. But you get the fidelity of also searching. You have the full text search behind it called hidden text because you can search on it, but it actually doesn't. It, it's not what you see. You're seeing the image of the document. So it's always going to look and feel exactly like the document. Even if there was an OCR glitch, it doesn't matter. But behind that, you have a fully textable searchable hidden text layer. That's an advantage you have with PDF, advantage number one. Advantage number two, the latest compression modalities, which CVID fully supports, in fact, we invented some of them, are supported by PDF. So for example, if you're capturing the JPEG or, or TIFF or, or standard PDF, a, we call it, say, Adobe PDF, you wouldn't get the full advantages of super compressed documents. So in the case of this document here, if it was a JPEG file, or even a JPEG RAF PDF file, you could be paying seven megabytes for this page. If you compress it, maybe you get it down to a meg. Beyond that, you'd start to see artifacts. Um, but we can get it down using the right compression techniques to about 100 kbytes a page with full image fidelity and full searchability. So you have support for very, very smart, serious compression techniques, both JPEG2 and MRC within PDF also. PDFA is very helpful for preservation. Let's say you want to take the paper and replace the paper with the captured document, with the PDF, right? We have companies that keep the paper, some of them, and they also keep the captured file around. They keep both. But more and more these days, we see companies that will capture their documents and not keep the paper anymore. Well, in that case, you've got to be sure that if it's a mortgage document or it's a form, whatever it is, and some of them, of course, are legal retention. Um, you got to be sure that you can reconstruct it. You can get back that file two years, three years, 10 years, 20 years, 37 years down the road. Um, PDFA guarantees that. It's a digital preservation standard. It's an ISO format. The PDFA, if you make your document PDF, but not just PDF, but also PDFA, which is just a mode under PDF, you're guaranteed it will always open. Everything you need to see and understand that file is embedded in the file. And you're guaranteed, as it's an ISO format and as PDF readers are pervasive all over, the, all over the globe, that you'll have no problem opening, reading, printing this file 30 years down the road because of PDFA. Now, <clears throat> some of the um, uh, industry uh, uh, standards that we're used to coming out of NARA, uh, for example, or, or ARMA strongly recommend we call metadata insertion because then, aside from the database knowing what's going on in this document, the document itself is a where self-aware of when it was created, relevant artifacts, the author, publisher, retention schedule, uh, key coded fields, can all be put into metadata, which means if you ever have a database port, which happens often, particularly when entities merge, or when you have an agency that's collapsed. So often you'll have a case where you have to port across databases, and it's very helpful to know the document has all the information embedded inside it. You can do that in PDF seamlessly through metadata insertion. Anything, any field that's critical to the document, you insert directly as a PDF metadata field, and it will always be there as it is part and parcel of the PDF file. Um, another guarantee, of course, with PDF, especially if you're using image plus in text mode, it always displays and looks exactly the same. Web optimization is also a very important feature, not part of TIFF, certainly not part of JPEG. If you want to view it on a mobile device, and you want to jump to page 19 of a 38-page file, you can do that directly. Because PDF, if it's done right, you set web optimization mode to on, it jumps directly to that page. It doesn't have to stream the pages before or after, for that matter, if you want to view it on the web. And you don't want to worry about downloading. You want to view page 128. You don't have to download all the pages before that. You can jump directly to the page that you're interested in. So you're going to get much faster retrieval times 
in terms of uh, a search query on a document that's a multi-page document with web optimization, which is also a very, very nice feature um, supported by PDF, but not supported by the other imaging standards. So again, you know, we'll just talk a little bit about compression here. It's definitely a best practice if you if you capture documents to be focused on compression aspect. Be sure they're as compressed as, as possible. Normally, what we'd expect if they're compressed well is that the compressed size of a captured document is no larger than the native electronic file. So if you had an original Word file, which is 50 pages, and you print it and we scan it, the standard Adobe's PDF or TIFF G4 PDF, you're looking at something which is generally um, 10 to 20 times the size of the original Word file. Uh, whereas if you use the latest compression techniques, which of course T-Vision stands behind in our PDF compressor product, you will get sizes equivalent to, sometimes smaller than, the original electronic file. So really compression can make a huge difference, and particularly these days when everybody's putting stuff in the cloud, are you worried about your mobile device, the battery's always always going? Well, the battery's always going because you're fetching a lot of stuff off the internet. And the more email you're reading and the larger those packets, the more your battery's dissipating. So compression can really be helpful in a few ways. One is minimizing your storage and backup costs, making access to documents as fast as possible, so that your email attachments are very small. Mobile accessibility, minimizing the time it takes for a scanned document to pop up on your mobile device, and also makes it very integratable into um, existing products. And again, you know, just think about an email attachment. If it's three megabytes, it's no problem, but if it's 30 meg, you really can't send it around as an email to anybody, certainly not to any of your friends. Um, we see here further example of document compression, and again, this is, uh, say, color capture. And um, in general, it's more efficient to access, view, and transmit. If you're interested in getting data, let's say structured data, removed from a form, you're better off if you want to capture the color, because then the rates for separating the data from the form under color are higher, significantly higher, than when you do a straight by tunnel scan. But you don't want the size file size to blow up. So to be able to capture the color, keep the full fidelity is extremely valuable. In this example, color capture, we get a 42 to 1. You see the original JPEG base. It says PDF, but PDF really is a very generic kind of wrapper, and you can stick a lot of formats in PDF. This initial PDF you're seeing here at 3 meg is really a JPEG in a PDF wrapper. But if you use super compressed MRC methods, this is very recent color compression technology, but fully supported by PDF if you use the right PDF compression tools. Um, and again, within C-Vision, we have a solution to that. But with the right compression, you're seeing a reduction here, 3 meg down to seven, three meg down to 73 k bytes. That's really the size of a black and white file, and yet you keep the full, the full color fidelity, and it's also uh, fully text surfaced. There is a bit of a myth, and we're here to demystify that for you. Is that correct? Demystify. Uh, hopefully, it's right. Um, we want to demystify it. So if, if you capture a normal color file, complete resolution, high res JPEG, it might be around 6 meg. If you started to say, well, let me lower the JPEG quantization factor and try to scrunch this thing down, generally what you're going to do is you're going to lose all semblance of readability because JPEG doesn't understand anything about intelligent layer separation or how to segment documents, how to separate text from pictures. It doesn't do any of that. It does a straight JPEG thing and gets rid of all the high frequency information. But you know what? Text happens to be high frequency. So you know what the first thing you're going to lose is your text readability and your OCR rates are going to plummet. So compression with plastic compression methods really won't work. However, if you use some of the later, more advanced, we'll call them super compression modes available within PDF, like MRC coding, you will keep the full fidelity because it will do a layer separation. Text is kept without any distortion at the full resolution. Not only that, it's fully searchable. So here you have something that was 6 meg reduced using color compression down to 96 k bytes. That's a full color scan with text searchability behind it. Really the right way to do your documents. Um, now let's say you have mobile devices and maybe you want to push certain things to people on the road. See, that was the left and right. We'll show you that again, give you a feel. But really it's linear. When you, when you talk about mobile, 
it, if you try mobile downloads, whatever you're downloading you know, from a mobile site, whether it's documents, whether it's video, uh, it's linear in the size of those bytes. So if you have a, a, a say a byte size, a file stream that's ten times larger, it's going to take ten times longer to see that file. It's pretty straightforward. Not to mention the dissipation on your battery is tenfold. It's fetching ten times as many packets, so your battery's going to go down much faster than you'd like it. So here you see as an example on the left, that was the compressed document, which is about to say five to ten times smaller, and then you've got the regular standard TIFF or JPEG or plastic PDF, just JPEG PDF, and there you may be taking 10 or 20 seconds or even a minute on something that should have taken a few seconds. So it definitely optimizes your experience with the mobile device, talking about faster access to documents, reduced cost associated with data usage, and makes it a lot easier to share, not just to read, but also to forward to someone else. Now, best practice, when you have a document of a certain kind, you want the capture modality to be synced with the document type. So, for example, if you're scanning 10 million pages in some kind of government repository and you know they're all black and white, you know they're all, then it's okay to capture the black and white. Where it's not okay to capture the black and white <clears throat> is if you've got something like mortgage documents where you've got color pictures in there and you know that you're going to have them. If you're dealing with magazines or brochures or catalogs, so things that are known to have color or grayscale components, if you capture by tonal, you're going to lose a lot of information. Obviously, in this case, we lost a lot of information. Okay, so, so the black and white mapping doesn't work in a lot of cases where the original wasn't black and white. In that case, if you want to get efficient rates, you've really got to be sure that you're using the right color compression method. Um, but if you do that, it allows you full color scanning. And color scanning here, just in this case, you get a cleaner document, right? So the one on the right, when you use super compression, which is what we advocate here in our PDF compressor line, you're paying less than 100k bytes for that full color file. So it's going to look a lot better than the one on the left, which, by the way, is also at least 100k bytes because it's a TIFF G4. The problem is TIFF is optimized using Huffman code, but not for that. It's used, optimized for, for text. So the cost of that is probably going to be 150k bytes on the left, maybe 200. The one on the right is less than 100. That's full color. So which would you rather have? Obviously, the color document. The OCR is going to be better because we haven't obliterated all the OCR information. It's still there. It's clean. It's been lifted. And the end, and the end product, the file size is smaller than had you made it to by tonal scan. So certainly, for many color documents, not only do you get much better results when you scan the color, but often the color size is going to be smaller than a black and white size. Um, we have many other cases, not only pictures, where you don't want to lose information, and therefore we advocate color scanning. So you might have highlighting. This is just a case where you want to pick up the highlights. And if you scan the black and white, you will, in fact, redact the highlight. So exactly what you wanted to focus on um, gets obliterated. In fact, I mean, these are sort of dual problems. The way we see them are discovery and redaction. You want to discover something, you want to highlight it so everybody sees it, like in some kind of legal discovery process. In security-related uh, fields, you may want to redact it, which is make sure no one sees it, and guarantee that it's redacted securely. But they're sort of dual, um, dual sides of the problem. But in this case, certainly, if the intention was to highlight it, which we're seeing above as a color highlight or a grayscale highlight, you don't want to end up with a redaction, which is what's going to happen. If you map the two, if you if you scan it to black and white. So let's talk a little bit more about document capture best practices. I want to focus on recognition. So recognition, of course, means you want to know what's in the document. You want to find stuff that's in the document. So if it's electronic, initially, if the components in the document are all electronic, typically recognition is fairly straightforward. Not always that straightforward because you're still taking stuff which may be semi-structured or less and mapping it maybe to something very structured. So recognition takes place, and DCL can probably tell you more about that as well, that just because you have something, a fully electronic PDF, doesn't mean you can map it to XML the way you'd like it, so you can use it in some sort of very structured universe. But you certainly have a more advanced recognition problem when you're starting with paper. You've got to capture that paper and first understand what's in it, even textually. So because of that, you want to give yourself the best possible chance of coming up with 
an automated solution or a very reliable solution. So for that, of course, the certain things do apply. Machine print typically you get much better recognition than handwriting. handwriting. We're not saying you can't try to automate a handwritten system, but normally handwriting is going to work if it's very limited to forms, particularly numeric fields might work. Um, machine print, though, the OCR is very reliable, and you can really automate around that. So we, we're not just talking about documents that are, are text searchable, but even pulling out fields automatically, reconciling or linking up with the database automatically once you're into machine print. A fully automated system that has a lot of handwriting is hard to engineer. We're not saying you can never build one, but very tricky to engineer. In general, do you want to do color versus by tonal? It depends on your domain, on your on your database set. If your documents are really color, we strongly recommend you do color capture. If they are by tonal and you know they're by tonal, you're probably going to be safe with a black and white capture solution. Image enhancement is often a very important piece of this coin as well. Um, if things are skewed, you want to rotate them back to readable. That's called de-skew. If you don't de-skew properly, often the recognition rate and the searchability, the accuracy of this document will go way down. <clears throat> and line removal can also be very helpful, particularly if you want to understand what's in a form versus data. Line removal can be a key component getting high recognition rates for forms-based documents. If we want to just give you a little bit of a feel for how you get higher accuracy rates, um, when you talk about data extraction, which is related, very close to related OCR, data extraction normally is, it's really optical character recognition, but applied to specific data fields you want to extract. But sometimes the field and the form will get confused with each other. So it's, you need an advanced OCR engine that can really separate out the, the foreground from the background, which is not trivial and often is a very confusing point. Done right, you can get very high accuracy rates, but you really have to know what you're doing. So normal OCR engine applied to a form is not nearly as accurate as a form-based product applied to a form that's very good at this data form separation. Here's another example here where you, where you could you confuse a box uh, where that line's coming up between the one and the three, and insert another one into the uh, OCR text stream, which of course will give you the wrong value. If it's a PO, you'll never match it against your PO system to get it wrong. So you want to be able to make a reasonable uh, distinction between the form and, and the data field here. So a smart OCR engine will in fact be able to tell because of the stroke thickness and other factors hopefully, and also knowing where the data field is located, that it's supposed to ignore that vertical line in there is not in fact an ASCII code, but rather part of the form behind it. Another example, we have um, dot matrix, of course, maybe less dot matrix stuff out there than there used to be, but certainly this is something that would confuse an OCR engine. Of course, then we have um, files where often the background is not constant. Maybe it's color. Maybe it's specifically made not to copy. So a smart OCR engine will be able to lift that foreground. And I would include, of course, the C-Vision in, in, in this list. It's tricky to do this right, but if you're doing it the right way, you have to understand that the background includes everything here about University of California Riverside. It's in fact, part of the, it's the background. It's the fiber of this uh, document, and you need to accept thresholds the right way. A standard threshold or binarization that would take place on an MFP, like your Xerox MFP, would not make this distinction. It's running off an ASIC chip that was built probably 10 years ago, maybe 20. And the foreground and background all collide. And you're not going to get any smart optical character recognition from this thing. Because at this point, you've messed up the background and the foreground. It's really hard to recover. Um, a cleaner separation would try to understand the layers, to soften the background and foreground, separate them out. You get something more like this. So if you're interested in automated transcript coding, which of course we are at T-Vision, uh, you want to separate the background and foreground as cleanly as possible. So now we also want to move on a little bit. We're talking about document capture as a way for companies to sort of move towards a paperless office. And if you're committed to document capture and committed to taking certain paper-based processes and making them electronic, then often what, what's relevant with that is let's take it to the next step. If we've taken the paper out of the office, can we now automate some of the paper-based 
business processes that were in the office. So, for example, if we can automate the mailroom and start capturing everything that comes into the mailroom with an OPEX and an IBM L scanner, we then take it to the next level and start routing it to the right groups of people automatically or automatically link it to a database that by the time a person sees it, all the relevant record data in the database about this document is displayed? So the answer is generally yes. By the time you make a commit, the company is willing to make some sort of commitment to document capture, often they can see additional ROI, sometimes very, very significant, by moving higher up the food chain and automating some of the processes that would normally be associated with that paper document. What would normally happen? Data would be extracted, let's automate that. It would be routed to a certain group of people, let's automate that. We link it against the record. You just paid your mortgage payment and we need to know who you are, what it's applied against. So the bank has to link that against your mortgage and give you credit. So to the extent that we can capture documents, the next step within a company or an agency, government entity, would, would often be what other processes, now that we've captured it, made it electronic, what are the processes around this document-based business process can we automate? So some examples, the classic document capture um, <clears throat> a process that we think about would often include taking the paper and making it an image of some sort, then OCR, which is now it's searchable, compression, now I can use it, send it to mobile, attach it to my email, convert it to PDF so it's universally readable, and clean it up by image processing. Those are all very important for what we call optimizing your scanned document. But of course, taking it to the next level is often where you're going to see the most ROI. Because we can talk about once you have that searchable, web-optimized, super-compressed PDF, how about automating various document processes? So for example, if you're an APAR department, why don't we automate your invoice stream? And we have clients where they've fully automated their AP, their invoices, right? You read the invoice, understand what's in it automatically, reconcile it against the open PO, and basic market is good to pay. You can automate your AP department, your AR department, invoice forms, mailroom for automated classification. What kind of document is this? Who do we route it to? Who has to see it? Classification. Classify what kind of document it is and maybe give it a priority. So the higher value often is once you've scanned it, what else can we do with it? We can automate certain business processes or maybe we're, the company is paying right now a lot of money to manually solve a problem where an automated solution exists. So this is really an important side. We're not going to dwell on this uh, too much today. I think there'll be a follow-up uh, webinar to deal with um, this issue of automating document-centric business processes. But certainly there's a lot of strong ROI in automating the processes associated with your document. So there are certainly ROI opportunities beyond document optimization. Optimized scans can produce higher automation rates, which is definitely true because the better the scan, like color capture, is going to lead to better invoice extraction, better forms extraction. So we see higher automation rates for invoices, forms, mailroom classification, if the scanning is optimized and done right. A poor scan leads to lower automation rates and a not as good ROI. Automated extraction can produce very measurable ROI within a company, within a government agency. Take you through through um, two client studies here to give you a feel for you know, how smart document capture is used. So in the first case, we have a large U.S. government agency who will remain nameless for now, responsible for monitoring individuals of interest, persons of interest, globally. Hopefully, uh, I'm not on that list. <laughs> Hopefully, Chris, you're not on that list. Uh, but it's persons of interest. And uh, they have to share this um, uh, sort of scanned passport photos in a very distributed environment to embassies and conferences all over the world, but have very, very different bandwidth um, capacity. So you want to send something as small as possible, or at least dynamically modulated per consulate, so it's as big or small as that, as that embassy can, can handle. This process requires maintaining the highest document fidelity. So you can't distort the image, that wouldn't work, but you want to make them as small as possible. In this case, the agency was not willing to compromise at all with document quality, but needed very serious image compression to handle this distributed environment and make all these color documents accessible in real time. So the solution in this case, after evaluating compression technology, particularly C-Visions and, and other technologies over a two-year period, the government agency, this federal government agency, purchased two unlimited licenses 
is our compressor product, and uses them in a very active production environment to generate and send documents concerning these persons of interest to all these locations all around the world on a regular basis. Uh, of course, benefits include faster transmission time, um, less time in terms of uh, waiting at the embassy or consul level to actually see it into document, making it very efficient to transmit, etc. And of course, making the world a safer place using sea visions compression technology. We feel good about that. Uh, another success story, this is from the banking industry. So the top five, we're not going to mention the name here, but this is probably some the company everybody knows and probably a good number of people on with us today actually bank there. Uh, so it's a, it's a global financial firm, and it has some challenges associated with high volume scanning. They were doing serious document capture already 10 years ago, but it wasn't very smart. In fact, it was all TIFF back in the day, and the file sizes were huge. So high storage and backup costs. And in fact, in a large bank, this entity was paying the bank, even though it's all the same bank, but the mortgage group was actually paying another group to store and web host their file. So those those costs alone were significant, and they weren't searchable, um, and they weren't web optimized, and they weren't PDF, and they wasted a lot of time each month waiting for documents to arrive on the network. Of course, when they did, they were very large, bloated, and non-searchable. Solution was, and this has been in use at this bank for uh, probably eight or nine years now in a major way, that they use license via compressor, seemingly integrates with their capture workflow. Capture workflow could be EMC, Captiva, it could be Copac, it could be some other workflow, but we'll integrate with all of those. And they were able to compress their documents, I think, by a factor of about five to one over a tip. Of course, their PDF, the web optimized. They turn the OCR on, and they, be fully, they are fully searchable. And they do huge volume. This is uh, over 1 billion, 1.25 billion pages a year. And they really move from a TIFF workflow to a searchable, web-optimized PDF workflow with large savings in terms of uh, compression size and the cost they were paying for a cloud storage of these files. The benefit dramatically reduced their, their storage requirements, reduced their bandwidth upload-download time, which achieved ROI on the entire install within a year and made their employees more efficient because these documents had to be accessed, I think, at the branch level, and the faster they were accessed, um, the better client satisfaction and employee satisfaction was. Uh, so again, why C-Vision? Um, of course, we don't, not the only people producing PDFs, but we believe in for image capture that best of breed solution is a PDF solution. Within that, we offer the best of breed because if compression is key, we have the most serious compression technology out there. We've even licensed it back to Adobe. Um, standard PDFs are not super compressed. They're just image formats in a PDF wrapper. So a standard PDF is either a TIFF in a wrapper or it's natively electronic, which doesn't mean it's compressed necessarily, or it's JPEG in a wrapper. So a PDF, a standard PDF is not super compressed for efficient use on the web or within a mobile device. We generate the smallest PDFs out there anywhere. Um, makes your employees more efficient, reduces your cost, much better experience if you're on mobile devices. So CVision really is a very, very good, I think, the best solution. If you're looking for a PDF solution server class, I think uh, PDF, um, CVision PDF compressor really is the answer. Uh, but we certainly appreciate your time today, and hopefully we'll take some questions um, in, a, in a minute. But um, just some conclusions, I guess, about when you talk about document capture, we're really interested in moving most companies that have an interest in document capture to the next level, which we're calling smarter document capture, where you're really serious about compression, searchability, of optimization, all the things that are very relevant to smart document capture within an organization. It will create, done the right way, it creates more efficient employees, reduces your cost, storage, bandwidth, upload, download time, facilitates cloud and mobile collaboration, enables color scanning, generates very high quality, non-degraded PDF files, and should integrate with existing workflows. So again, um, thank you very much for your time today. And I think we're going to do a little QA at this point. Well, thank you, Ari. This was definitely very informative indeed. <clears throat> we have several questions that have already been submitted. And the first one's going to be, what file types can be compressed? Thank you, Adam. So essentially, 
any image format is going to compress quite well. So if you're talking about a TIFF G4, <coughs> that's an old standard. It's a nice standard. It's from the 80s. We typically can do five to ten times better than that. So if you're capturing your black and white files, it often, often will be TIFF G4, part of G4 version in that one's a PDF. And you can get maybe a five-fold reduction there. If it's JPEG or if it's TIFF, standard TIFF is really JPEG in the TIFF wrapper. Standard PDF for color is also JPEG underneath what the uh, deal we call CCT, but it's JPEG. So with color, maybe 10 to 100-fold. So Adam, in order, I guess an answer to your question would be, all standard image formats can be compressed or super compressed into PDF. And even within PDF itself, typically you can encode those to give you sort of the way we do it, you sort of zip. So even a fully electronic PDF can essentially be zipped you can get reduction even if it is a fully electronically generated PDF file. Thank you, Ari. Um, the next question that we've received is, what is the typical compression rate for a black and white TIFF? The compression rate for black and white TIFF would normally be about 5 to 1 if it's a 300 dpi dot per inch scan, which is normally, if you take a look at your office MFP device, that's the normal capture rate. So you can expect something 5 to 1. We've seen 10 to 1, too, sometimes, depending. But 5 to 1 is probably a good number. Thank you, Ari. Um, the next question we received is, does adding OCR make a file larger? Um, OCR, which stands for Optical Character Recognition, um, will make a file larger. Often it's, it's not much larger, meaning once you've compressed, you've got an image PDF, maybe you're adding another 10%. So just for example, if you scan a, um, a five-page document and you're paying about 15K bytes, about 75K maybe for the compressed PDF, and maybe another 15K bytes for the OCR layer. So normally we would say it's, it's pretty minimal and you get the full searchability. So maybe we'd add another 10%. So it's fairly nominal for the PDF size. Thank you. Um, several more questions, and the next one is, do users need to decompress the files in order to open them? Uh, okay, good question. Um, so the answer is no. I mean, all the PDFs we make are, are very standard ISO. ISO is, of course, an international uh, format. So they're all ISO PDF files that any reader can read. So there would be no decompression that would be re required. Of course, there's a lot of different ways to write PDF. We at CVision write the world's smallest PDF files. But what's nice about it, any PDF reader, any PDF acrobat will open it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. The next question is, does this technology work with SharePoint? Um, yeah, I mean, it should be interoperable with SharePoint because SharePoint really, you know, understands the PDF format, will index on the PDF format. Um, so if you drop in a SharePoint folder, it's going to be fully text searchable, displays. So the answer would be yes. It's fully interoperable uh, with SharePoint. Excellent. Um, the next question is, does this technology work with EMC Documentum and or Captiva? Right, okay. Um, Good question. So, so the answer is, of course, we we work with EMC in an EMC workflow. In fact, uh, a lot of our best clients are EMC clients, and you can use CVism PDF compressor solution within EMC because they have something called Captiva, and Captiva has a module specifically PDF optimizer for IA, and PDF optimizer is our PDF compressor um, that's made specifically for the EMC workflow. We also, for Copex, have custom module, KCM module, will work within an existing COFAX workflow. And of course, with Documentum, you can apply it as well. Uh, there's a version of PDF Compressor for that as well. Thank you, Ari. Um, the next question is, do you have an API available? We have an API available. And um, it's a .NET-based API. So yes, you can call us programmatically. And some of our users out there, of course, embed us in an OEM sense within their own product offering. So, and by the SDK. So we have we have an API. Yes. Thank you. Um, the last question we've received so far is: 
what are the modes available to process documents using this technology? Right. So, so we have a few different uh, modes to call a product, of course. Uh, one is we have a GUI, which gives you a lot of control, lets you set the compression settings, those here on, off, and security levels, metadata that's all done at the GUI level. You can also throw it into a watch folder. That's how I guess a lot of our clients will use this. We have watch folders where hot folders and documents can be in there, even recursively. And we pull all those watch folders. And whenever there's a new document in there, it senses it and will process it. So there's GUI control. There's watch folders. There's command line. There's also SDK control. And uh, you can also use this through web service. Thank you, Ari. That's uh, at this time all the questions we've received. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, this concludes today's broadcast. You can access the recorded version of today's webinar in the archive section of our website at www.vclab.com. Our next webinar will be Wednesday, June 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, titled Sprinkle the Pixie Dust, How to Sell Your Content Management Initiative Internally which is being presented by Joanne Hackles, President and CEO of Contact Services, and Suzanne Mescon, Director of Marketing for Science Systems. Thank you, everybody, for attending, and have a great day.